My name is Chris, though you might recognize my voice from another channel called Stohove, where I do various tutorial videos for Fantasy Grounds Unity. In collaboration with Smiteworks, I have been asked to introduce you to a new feature that has been added to Fantasy Grounds Unity in relation to reference manuals for your modules. The Manual Builder is an editor that will allow a content creator to provide a reference guide alongside their modules. This centralizes documentation that is otherwise typically scattered about notes or story entries that can sometimes be quite difficult to find. Through the use of the Manual Builder, you'll now be able to provide your audience with a structured, more easily readable document that can also include images loaded through assets to help with documenting the use of a given module. The feature was introduced with Fantasy Grounds Unity 4.1.12, and it can be found under the Library category and within the Modules panel. On the lower portion of the panel, you will find a new button called Builder, specifically between the Export button and the Search box. When you click on the button, it will open up an empty reference panel, but it has the means to add some elements to it, turning it into an editor window. For comparison, if I load up an actual module, uh, let's say, eh, let's go for the Acquisition Incorporated one here. If I take a look at that reference manual, specifically this part here, you'll see that it has content that has been populated. This is essentially what your manual will eventually look like once you've gone through and added in some content. But we'll get to that in a moment. In the top left of the Table of Contents panel, you will see a lock icon next to the New Chapter button. This locks the content of the manual that you are editing, so that it becomes read-only until you unlock the manual again. As you add content to the editor, the position of this lock will remain pinned to the upper left corner of the button. So if I click New Chapter, for example, you'll see that this doesn't move. At the bottom of the panel, you will see a Keyword Gen button right here. This is used to create a searchable index list of keywords once you've completed editing a given manual. You do not need to manually add these index entries because once you're ready to export your module, all you have to do is click this button and it will automatically create the index for you. In the middle of the reference panel, specifically between the table of contents panel on the left and the page panel on the right, you'll see an icon that looks like an arrow pointing left. If this icon is clicked, the Table of Contents panel will disappear, and you will be presented with a full view of a given page that you might be in the process of editing or viewing. Additionally, at the bottom of the reference panel, near the middle of the page panel, specifically down here, you will see arrows that will begin to appear that point left and right. These arrows are used for page navigation, much like you use them when moving through a story or reference manual that was published with an existing module. Adding content to the reference manual is quite simple. You can start simply by clicking on the New Chapter button here. This is going to create three new elements, as well as add in a few more navigational and content creation options. The three new elements are a chapter title entry point, a new subchapter title entry point, and a new page entry point, all of which will allow you to enter in alphanumeric text so that you can organize your chapters as you see fit. Underneath the new elements are two new buttons, one called New Page, which will create a new page entry point, and another called New Subchapter button, and this will be used to create an additional subchapter entry point that can then take additional page entry points. To the left of the three new elements, you will also see up and down arrows, which we will cover a little later on in the video, as well as red circles with a vertical line through them. If you've ever had to remove an element from a character sheet or some other information panel within Fantasy Grounds Unity, you'll know that the red circle contains a deletion action that you must click twice to completely remove that element. For example, if I remove this subchapter, I click it once, I get a horizontal line. I click it again, that confirms the deletion. And that's for anything that you have to go through and delete. In this case, when you make use of the chapter deletion action, it is going to delete all items directly linked to that chapter that you just removed. This is going to include subchapters and any and all pages linked to those subchapters. For example, as you can see, the entire grouping of new entry points is gone. 
The deletion action is going to be restricted entirely to just that chapter and its linked elements. It is not going to remove other chapters. So if I go and add in a new chapter, for example, you'll see that I just simply deleted one chapter and it left the other intact. Another thing that I want to point out is that as you edit the structure of the table of contents on the left and fill in content for pages using the page panel on the right, that content is saved to disk as soon as you make the change. And it is something that will also survive a complete restart of Fantasy Grounds Unity's interface and simply going back into the builder button will reopen what it was that you were working on. So if I just simply add in a couple of elements here and then I'll explain these a little bit later on and then I go and close out Fantasy Grounds and reopen it, which I'm not going to do here in this particular case, but simply going back into the builder, you'll see that all of that information is still there. Now I've gone ahead and cleared everything out there, but of the three elements, two are indicated through a difference in coloration of the background in the text field. The dark gray background represents your chapter titles and can be considered the topmost element of a given chapter. It might not be readily apparent, but this is a text entry box. And once you click within that particular entry box, you will be able to enter in some text in order to describe that chapter. So I'm just gonna call this chapter one. Additionally, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new chapter and call that chapter two, just so that we have a couple of things there that we can make use of a little bit later on in the video. Now, a chapter can be shifted above or below another chapter element. So you can see here, I've just flipped the position of chapter one and chapter two. And you do that utilizing these particular up and down arrows. However, I wanna point out that you cannot move a chapter past the particular entry point for the reference guide, so it can't go outside the panel. Nor can you move a chapter below its lowest position. And that just makes sense. However, you can go through and shift the position of everything that you have there. And specifically, now you see here that I'm clicking on this down arrow. Well, I can just simply click on the up arrow again if I wanna return the chapters to their original position. But it gives you a means to go through and shift the entire contents of a given chapter to an earlier or later location in the manual as you adjust the organization of said manual. It should be noted that a chapter element is not directly linked to a page element or any page content. So if you only have a chapter element, don't expect to be able to edit it and add any content to a page panel until you have specifically added a subchapter and then a page to that subchapter. So for example here, if I remove that subchapter and I edit anything here, this page that you see here is actually this page because it's the only one that is left. If I go through and add in a new chapter and add this, I can show you that that's the case because if I click here, you'll see that it stays on the page that you edit. You can only flip between pages and have that right panel change anything. Now, as I stated earlier, a chapter can be made up of multiple subchapters, and the new subchapter reference is once again something that you can change to any title that you would like, much like you would with a chapter title. So I'm going to call this subchapter 1. And I'll edit this one to be subchapter 2. A subchapter is used to group pages in a very specific order that you'd like to use to showcase the content of that manual to a viewer. However, a subchapter is unable to exist without being contained within a chapter, and it is unable to take other subchapter elements as child elements, only pages. Now you might notice that when you click a new subchapter, you're gonna automatically get a new page entry, and that's because a subchapter is really organizing those pages. So the assumption is you're going to be adding in new pages to it. Hence, Fantasy Grands Unity creates one for you. Using the up and down arrow keys, you can shift the location of a given subchapter as well as all of its linked pages within a given chapter or to a new chapter entirely, as long as one exists, providing a nice convenient way for you to move content throughout the manual as adjustments need to be made. So if I update this to be subchapter three, and then I go ahead and push this up, you'll see that subchapter three is now up here this new page element was actually the same page element that went with chapter three. And I'll change this title so that you can see it. And yes, I know I put trust in there. It should be test. 
Anyway, if I move this up to chapter one, you'll see that this has now grouped itself into chapter one and is no longer part of chapter two. So it allows you to organize subchapters as you see fit, as well as as you go through and enter a new content. Sometimes the organization changes while you're doing that. Or rather, I should say that you might realize that the organization might need to change. Fantasy Grounds isn't going to change the order for you automatically. You still have to do that. Now, it should also be noted that deleting a subchapter is also going to take all the pages associated with that subchapter. You will see that the pages that are linked to subchapter 1 and 2 still exist, whereas the one that was linked to subchapter 3 is now gone. And finally, it should also be noted that a subchapter is what binds one or more pages to a given chapter, and it will shift around with that chapter if you choose to move the entire chapter to a different location. So don't worry about having your chapters in a very specific order until you've finished going through and adding in your information, because all the content will shift around with it, and you don't have to worry about it. A page is what will be used to actually store the content you intend for a given reader. And each page can contain multiple types of elements as seen via the icons that you might have seen pop up on the page panel once a page has been actually created and or selected. When you do select a page title, it can be edited just like a subchapter and a chapter title, thus allowing you to give a name for the reader's benefit. So I'm going to call this page number one. And just for kicks, I will update this to be page number two. Now, as you add pages to a given subchapter, they're going to remain where they were created unless you choose to use the up and down arrow keys to change the order that a particular page is displayed in. So don't feel that you need to put content in, into pages in a very specific order because you can shift things around very easily. So if I go through and create a page three here and then create a new page down here, say page number four, I can go ahead and once I realize that maybe the content of page number three should be down in the second subchapter, I can go through and make sure that it gets moved to the right location. And as you just saw, pages can also be shifted out of one subchapter using the same up and down arrows such that when a page is at the top of its subchapter and it is shifted upwards, it will appear in the subchapter above it, while those that are moved past the point of the last entry point of that particular subchapter will be moved to a subchapter below it. You can also shift pages through chapters by moving it to the topmost subchapter of a particular chapter and then bumping it up once more to move it up to the lowest subchapter within the upper chap chapter that might be listed above it. And as you saw, when I moved page three, it popped into subchapter two because that's the only subchapter that exists here. But if I go ahead and push page three back up to the, say this subchapter up here, you can see that it will bounce into this location, not into subchapter one. Whereas if I move it down below to the lower subchapter, it will appear above the new page. So it's always going to shift down to the next open space, if you will, when it comes to moving content around. A page, once it's deleted, will delete the entire contents of a given page. And we haven't really added anything just yet, but as the content is not backed up anywhere else, when you remove that particular page, it's going to take it with it. So you're going to want to be very careful about which page you actually remove, because once it's gone, that's it. There's no backup. Now, once a page has been selected and or created, new options are going to appear on the right here, and it will allow you to edit the contents of that particular page. These elements are essentially wrappers for the type of content that you intend to put in your manual, and they contain very specific kinds of content. There are a total of six different page elements, and they are as follows. The text entry element, a split text entry element, the header element, the image element, the split text and image element, and finally, the split image and text element, and you'll see the differences here shortly. Additionally, there are also two new icons that will appear at the top left and top right of that particular page. The icon at the top left can be used to link this page into another page element, allowing you to make an in-page table of contents or quick link to another page. You can also use it and drag it down. Oops, don't want to drag the whole window. 
into your little quick bar here so that if you wanted to, you can open it up in an entirely separate window. While the lock on the top right is used to lock the contents of the page so that it can no longer be modified. As you can see, once I click this, the elements icons have gone away. Now I'm going to go ahead and cover each of the types of elements next. So the first one I'm going to cover is the text element. And the text element is used to create one or more paragraphs that will run the full length of the page, or rather the width, essentially giving you a means to provide as much or as little detail as you would like to enter. Now there is some format control within a particular page. So if I do this, actually this is, is an example paragraph. As you can see, my typing still has not improved. But anyway, as you go through and you type in content, the elements by default will stay with the spaces that you have gone through and created. So if I go through and lock, it essentially is going to lock that into place. It doesn't really matter whether it's like this or not. But when this module is exported, those extra spaces, they're going to stick around. And essentially, that means that if you include extra spaces, as well as ensure that there are new lines that you've gone through and created, they are going to be retained so that you can space out the content as much as you like or cram it all together into one large paragraph, though that would be less useful for your readers. It should also be noted that all text fields, and this is going to be true for all of the other text fields that we're going to cover, act like you're editing a story page. And this means that you can change a font from a normal font to a bold or italicized font, or make use of a different formatting option that you would be able to make use of as part of a story element. This includes lists, tables, chat frames, and all other story elements that you can create on a typical story page. All you have to do is right click within the text entry box, and you can see here that you can change the different paragraph types. And this gives you the body text, headings, chat frames, lists, links, as well as tables. Now, if you have content selected, you can also change its formatting. So it can be bold, italicized, or underlined. Now, I'm going to temporarily shrink this up a little bit, just so that I have a little bit of room for the next element. And that is the split text element. This is the left column. And this is the right column. And you can use the split text element to create a tabular split between two separate paragraphs or text entry boxes. Using these split text elements, you'll be able to create two columns of text, much like some printed Dungeons and Dragons supplement manuals that have been published, specifically how they are formatted. There are any number of uses for organizing text this way, but it is there to provide you an alternative to simply dumping large paragraphs all over your manual and gives you another means to organize the content for your manual. And once again, because this is a text entry box, all of the text formatting options exist, much like they did for the primary paragraph entry box. The header element is a great way to create content separation within the same page as well as embolden the font to provide a nice title for someone to use for reference within the page. For example, this an example header. The content of the header is currently, at least at the time of this recording, only able to be displayed in center aligned alignment within the element. But that may be me not recalling the right keyboard combination to change the element or it's something that has not yet been implemented or something that might not even get implemented. But this element is still a great way to subcategorize the content of your manual within a page, ensuring a decent level of organization and presentation capabilities. Now the image element is something that you can use to add different kinds of image assets to the manual. These can include things like tokens or images that you can drag in from the assets window, but it will not allow you to drag in portraits. It is, however, a great way to add visuals to the manual, breaking up the overall wall of text with some map or token or some other form of image to help carry the information you're trying to convey through the manual. To use an image element, all you have to do is click on this image block icon here 
and it will create an empty quote unquote frame for your image. Then simply go to assets and let's say I want to drag in this bear token. You can just go ahead and do that and it's just drag and drop. And that's it. Now it will also accept captions. So I can give it a title or element and there's really no length to it. It'll sort of expand out, but unfortunately it's restricted to the size of the image. So the longer the text that you have here and the smaller the image, the more it's going to do something like this. So if you have something small, it's generally recommended that you limit the amount of text that you're going to use there. Now, the last two elements are essentially the same thing, but they organize your information slightly differently in that they can place text alongside an image. One will display text on the left side and an image on the right, while the second element will do the opposite and display the image on the left and text on the right. So if I go ahead and click each of these, you will see the text here with the image element there, whereas this one has the image element here and a text entry box here. Adding an image works the exact same way as one would for the standalone image element, but you'll want to be somewhat careful here as the text of the image, specifically how much space you have, will change depending on how large the image is. What do I mean by that? Well, let's just put in a little bit of text here, and I'm going to just randomly put in a bunch there to make sure that I have a long enough string. I'm then going to go to an asset and go to an image in this particular case, and I'm going to take this image here. If I drop this image into place in this icon here, you'll see what happens. It will reduce the overall size of the image somewhat, but then cram up the text. The larger the image, the less space you're going to get for text. And the only way to reduce that space that the image is going to use up, at least at the time of this recording, is through shrinking the size of the source image itself before it's loaded into the assets window that you see here. However, this is still highly useful to provide a means to display these assets side by side and break up the presentation of your manual and make them a little bit more interesting and possibly visually appealing. If you've been paying attention, you might have noticed the little icon that is always present near the upper left corner of a text entry box. This is a field modification action that allows you to change the visual appearance of a given text field and this applies to all elements that contain a text field. Now the modification can affect both the borders of the field as well as the coloration of the background, but they don't always change both at the same time. As an example, if I add the parchment modifier to this particular field, you will see that it converts that section of the text, specifically the whole text box here, to make it look like it's bound parchment. At the time that I wrote this script, there were some additional options that were here, some of which made adjustments to the top and bottom of the border but didn't touch the sides, and vice versa. They made modifications to the sides, but they didn't adjust the top and the bottom part of the, the borders there, but they did alter the background. Unfortunately, they seem to have gone. So I don't know if that is an intentional removal or if this is just simply bugging out and it's no longer showing it to me. But in any event, you can go ahead and change pretty much the contents and the borders of all of these particular fields as you see fit. It should be pointed out though that image fields don't get that border change because the image itself is meant to represent the coloration and background and border changes that you're planning on putting in there. It's only the text fields that have that alteration. It does however exist on the text fields for the split text and image frames. But once again, these options give you another means to change the appearance of your manual and help provide an interesting display to the information that you're trying to convey. Just like the contents of the left menu, it's also possible to shift the position of elements on a given page. So that if you realize a little later that you've started adding content and that a header might help present the information a little bit better, you can go ahead and add it and then use these arrows to move it up to the position that you need it in. So you can see here I've moved it to the top. However, an element that is a split entry, like these particular text fields here or the split image ones, they move the entirety of that particular element, not just the left or the right column. They're not moved independently. They're taken as a group. This ensures that as you move those elements around, they stick together. Another thing to note is that an element can't be shifted to a different page using this method and you'll need to create a new element in the target page 
and copy and paste that text into that new element if it's a text-based one, or drag images into place. And images also can't be moved that way in the sense that you can't drag and drop them onto a new page. What you have to do is grab them from the asset window and then drop them onto the new page, specifically into the new element where you're placing them. Now lastly, it's also possible to export the manual as part of a module. And while we did not cover module development in this video, I can very quickly show you how to ensure that your manual is indeed included in an exported module at the time that you're ready to complete that export. Once again, you'll want to access the module information panel from the library dropdown category. So if I click this button, I get this window. You'll see next to the builder button is an export button that once clicked will display an export information panel. Now there are a large number of options that are beyond the scope of this particular video. And there's really only one location that we need to focus on right now, and it's under the exported record types section of this particular information panel. If you scroll down to almost the bottom of the list, you'll see there's an entry for the reference manual. This should be checked to ensure it's exported at the time your module is exported as a whole. So if you click this little checkbox here, it will now take this particular reference manual that I have here and export it as whatever module I created as. However, it is possible to simply create a module that contains nothing but this manual. And it's a great way to create a custom set of guidelines and rules for your groups that you can edit through a master module, export it, and then load it into your various campaigns so that it can be used and provided to the players. However, you'll want to ensure that you also select the player module option, which is right here if you're going to do that. And that's just simply because if you don't select this, players won't be able to load it and thus be able to see it on their side of the actual connection. And once again, I want to thank you for watching this particular video, both on behalf of Smiteworks and myself. I also want to continue to thank Smiteworks for providing me with the opportunity to present this information on their channel and look forward to continuing with our collaboration. I hope you found the information in this video useful for you to be able to understand the reference manual features of Fantasy Grounds Unity. And if you have any questions or comments about this video, please use the comment section below to post them and Smiteworks and I will do our best to answer any that require a response. Please click on the like button if you found this information of this particular video useful to helping you learn how to use Fantasy Grounds Unity, and consider subscribing to the Smiteworks Fantasy Grounds YouTube channel to keep up to date with new content as it is released.